I think it's, you have to think about what's, what's, what's producing the most profit in my business right now. And uh, do I, can I continue to sell to those individuals? Or can I find those people in a different way that's more cost effective? So for example, I talked with a franchisee recently in Denver, Colorado. She does her business and she was spending money on marketing, but she found it wasn't working as well as she was hoping it would. So she was looking at how can I be more effective in finding people that actually know my customer. So she made a list of 30 different ancillary businesses that kind of intersect with hers. And she spends an hour every single day going out and building relationships with people on that list. And so as a result, she has found more connections with people. She gets more referrals. She does really well in her business because of that. Welcome to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast, where we talk about all things franchising. Now, here's your host, Dr. John P. Hayes. Hi, this is John Hayes. Another episode of the Franchise Hot Seat. My guest is James Butler, a serial entrepreneur, author of uh, 20 books, and a franchise sales coach. But James, I know you and your wife owned franchises. I think uh, maybe bridal shop franchises. Well, Tell it us wasn't more about a, that side of your yeah. Life. We owned three different bridal stores at one point. I've owned five different businesses. I've taken from the, the startup stage over a million dollars a year in sales. But what happened in that specific situation was is that we uh, we just found that it'd be better for us to. I actually went to a franchise attorney and met with him about franchising our concept and decided against that idea. But um, I've owned multiple businesses before and I've done a lot of consulting for franchise ors and helped them in their sales process and stuff like that. So, all right. So interesting that you decided against franchising uh, initially. And my first question is as a, a franchise coach, somebody who's been in franchising a long while, as I have been, you've written a number of books, substantial books, uh, beginning with we're going to talk about franchise growth strategies. Do we have too much franchising already? Is it time to say enough's enough? You don't have to franchise everything. Yeah, I think sometimes people want to franchise things for whatever reason. Sometimes businesses don't lend themselves well to franchising. Others do. Um, I think ultimately that's kind of what I, uh, retail is a tough business, I think. Um, anyway, but uh, part, that's partly why we decided not to do it was a retail business. And I think there's other business models that make more sense to do that. But yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's, I think if you have a good idea, that you can definitely make something work, but you have to differentiate yourself and be different. That's the challenge I think today is there's lots of franchises that are all trying to do the same thing and they're competing against each other in a way that's not as helpful as it could be. So I think you really have to really be working in a way that makes sense for people. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it's, I think that no, the right I, thing is con it, can make sense. But what's interesting now in the industry is we're seeing a lot of consola uh, consolidation. So we're seeing people that are like authority brands or premium service brands or five-star franchising that are acquiring different brands and put them all up to one different thing and promoting that overall parent brand uh, too. So that's kind of an interesting concept as well. Yeah, so I was at lunch yesterday with a um, former franchisee. He owned KFC at one point, owned a lot of them, owned Jamba Juice, uh, decided uh, he sold out of everything, recently out of Jamba Juice, and uh, asked me to go to lunch with him. And he said, um, what, can I, what can I get into now that is not food? He's had enough of the food category. Okay, understandable. Uh, we talked quite a bit about service businesses in particular. He likes to, to own multiple territories, and he doesn't want to be uh, working in them all day. So he's been an absentee owner um, successfully on a number of occasions. We walked outside after lunch, and we walked past this small gym, small gymnasium, and I... I'm not going to mention the brand, small brand, probably eight, nine franchises in Florida. And I said to my friend, uh, this is a franchise, by the way. And he looked at me and he said, why would anyone franchise that? Why do you need help to franchise a small gym? It's not Planet Fitness. It's not LA Fitness. Do people not understand that franchising doesn't work for everything? Mm. So what do you think? A small gymnasium, a uh, fitness center needs, a, th this is a brand fitness center, <laughs> but it's very small. Well, I think there are brands out there that can be really good for that. There's different niches you can do there too. You know, like Stretch Zone, for example, is an example of a small space. They do really, really well. They're profitable businesses in that, in in that particular concept. I think there's other ones out there, if they don't have good marketing and they, and they can do really well in a small area, that's fine, but they do have to market more. 
and or they try to if they try to depend on foot traffic, that's kind of a challenge. But it really kind of depends on the brand. I think some brands do a good job supporting their franchisees and help them. Others, they just don't provide as much support as they want. I think some people get into franchises because they think they're going to make a lot of money through franchise fees and also from royalties, but they don't know how to support their franchise or they don't have a really good model in the very beginning to start the business itself. So, and this is where the struggle is. This is why so many emerging franchise brands never get beyond 10, 10 sales, yeah. and most of those don't aren't successful. And two-thirds of franchise brands in America, according to the International Franchise Association, never reach 100 outlets. I mean, that, when, when you think about that, why would you franchise if you're not going to get at least 100 outlets? When do you start making right. money as a franchisor? It's not, it's not in the first dozen, 25, 30 franchises even. You don't make enough royalty to turn the lights on. Why do you think people are so drawn to franchising their business? And it seems today like no matter what it is, they turn to franchising. Have we done that somehow? The book authors, the speakers, the uh, trade shows? Well, I think franchising has been around for a long time. Um, and it's, it's a good business model, but there are challenges with it. And we can discuss those a little bit if you want to. But I think the, the key component here is is that you know, not every business should be franchised. And I think there's a lot that most franchisors go into, they just don't understand the industry or the business. They think this is a cool concept, this is a great idea, but they don't actually uh, really know how to sell the business very well or yeah. help the people succeed. So that's really the, sh the struggle, I think, is that yeah. franchisors enter not knowing a lot of the pieces for it and they make mistakes and that's the, the biggest challenge. So I wanna stick for just a moment on this uh, small fitness center. When my yeah. friend said to me, why would you franchise that? And why would you buy that? Well, I, I, I was stumped for a moment. Uh, we discussed it further and uh, we, we both said, no, we would not buy that as a franchise and we would not franchise uh, that concept. It's, it's not that the, the, the space was small. What, what Stretch Zone does is in a much smaller, what Massage Envy does, right. much smaller retail space. This is a lot of equipment. You, you know, if you're going to go to work out and, and this is something you pride yourself on doing, I obviously do not. But people who do, they want to make sure they have the right equipment to work out. Otherwise, right. how, how, how are you going to build? What do you build with a small neighborhood type gymnasium that you could convince someone in Texas, Wyoming, Ohio, California to buy a franchise of that brand? Yeah, I think it's the community that they create for people to go exercise and work out at. You know, I, yeah. I have a couple of rigged friends who own, who started a, a franchise called Iron Tribe Fitness. And that's the same kind of a thing. It's a small CrossFit type gym experience. Yeah. And they do really well, but their whole thing is around marketing and building a community of people that want to work out together. And um, that could be really good, but it's, it, I think if you're, you have to be really specialized in what it is you're doing. I think that's a key component for why some franchisors do really well with an area because they specialize in a specific group of people. They're building community around people want to work out there. And a more generic or and if you have a lot of equipment, a lot of expense there, that's much more challenging. There's a lot of other fitness businesses like boxing fitness franchises and other things like that. that there's not that much equipment. And so it's a lot less expensive to open the franchise or like Stretch Zone, they just basically need tables to do that. And um, it works out pretty well. I think yeah. the, the overall cost of the business is less. So and some of these smaller the smaller concepts um, just don't have the marketing prowess. And yeah. when they sell a franchise and they expect the franchisee to do the marketing, unless the franchisor is going to do the marketing for you, open your eyes. Are you able to do marketing? Do you have the money to do marketing? Are you right. gonna hire somebody to do the marketing? These are things that franchisors obviously don't always think through carefully and that franchise buyers think it's turnkey. We've sold a lot of this turnkey idea in franchising that you turn the key, open the door, and the lights come on, and wow, you're making a million dollars. Somebody's going to have to do the marketing. If that's not you, and if it's not the franchisor, who's it right. going to be? So that's difficult. When you're, and when you're competing against the gigantics, Planet Fitness, LA Fitness, the, the, these are, the, the, they get their marketing for a much smaller fee and they yeah. can afford to do more marketing than some small 
startup that's uh, that's going to struggle. At any rate, that's uh, I, I've been thinking about this lately because I'm a huge proponent of franchising, obviously. 40 plus years doing this. I lead the Titus Center for Franchising. We teach franchising. We believe in franchising. The university introduces in the fall a new major, franchising and entrepreneurship. We're clearly uh, behind it. But I think sometimes it's uh, good advice to suggest slow down and take a look at what you're really going to franchise and whether or not that makes sense given what the cost of franchising alone. All right, well, let's talk about uh, idea days. It's one of, uh, one of your strategies. I liked when I saw your book, Franchise Growth Strategies. Is that available on Amazon? Or what, it what is, is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep, Amazon. So in Franchise Growth Strategies, you talk about having an idea day as a way to make big breakthroughs in business. So I want to explore that. I, I like that section. Uh, remind me of a couple of other techniques that that I've used or been introduced to. How do you do this? How do you how do you have time to have an idea day? You know, nowadays we don't have time to do anything other than you know our work. Yeah, you have to plan it. I think that's the key thing. Is that a lot of times what I have done is when I'm traveling to a um, you know a conference or something like that, I'll book an extra day in the hotel the day before or the day after the conference to write down my ideas from what I've learned from that. And I also take a folder with me from where I, I, have what's, I have an idea notebook that I carry around with me and it has my ideas. There's different segments I have broke that broken down into. But the key thing is you have to schedule that time to work on that and, and put those ideas into process. So for me, it's kind of more like, uh, you know, figuring out what, what are some questions I should be asking myself about my business. And I think one of the key ones that I talk about in the book is you have to ask yourself, am I on the right trajectory? Is what I'm doing right now going to get to me my goals, what I'm accomplishing? And most people just get busy doing things. They don't take time to reflect and think about where am I actually going with this? Is this the right path for me to be on? And idea day, really what it allows you to do is to kind of question maybe your beliefs or your thoughts about those ideas so you can actually focus on the right things. And that's a key component for sure. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, strategy. It's also a great training point. Yeah. When you help people, and in my career, helping franchisees, helping franchisors, helping students, um, I say, ask the question, is what you are doing right now going to help you achieve a goal? Now, first right. of all, you got to have goals. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, sure. we know that most people don't have goals. Uh, they have wishes, but they don't have specific, written down, strategic, like you and I are similar. This is my idea book. It's with me uh, all the time. Sometimes I get buried in it, but you got to ask that question. What I'm doing right now, is this going to get me from point A to point C, where I want to be at the end of the day, the end of the week, or whenever? And right. if the answer is no, it's not, stop doing it. And people don't think that way. Maybe for, you know, I don't think that way sometimes. I find myself caught up, distracted, doing multiple things, none of which will lead to a long-term goal or a short-term sure. goal that I have in mind. But we do these things for, because we're human. It's the yep. human experience. But we've got to train ourselves not to do it that way. The idea day helps. Well, I, I think the other thing I would just say, too, is that like when I, my idea day is I like to plan out, I, I write a list of things where I put out ideas I want to do together and then I actually execute on okay, how do I organize what I'm going to do and how am I going to prioritize my life going forward so I'm actually going to make sure these goals actually happen. Yeah. And I think that's a key thing. I also spend some of my idea day reading and thinking about what other successful business leaders are doing in different industries, how I can apply those ideas to my industry or my thoughts, what I'm doing there too. And then, But the key thing is when I leave that idea day, I have a list of activities I'm going to work on going forward for the next month or the next three months or whatever time it is in between my idea days. I think if you're a growing franchise or should it be at least doing this quarterly, but it's better if you can do it once a month because it gives you time to step away from the business for a little bit and reflect and think. And again, I don't think most executives take enough time to think about their business, the direction it's heading in and stop doing the things that aren't working and start doing more of the things that are working. Yeah. So one of the things you've got to be careful of, and you talk about this in your book, activity versus accomplishment trap. Yeah. Because we're busy doesn't mean we're going to accomplish anything. People fall into this all the time. Yeah, it's a key thing. I think, again, just taking the time to think about, is my activity today leading toward my ultimate goal? 
Now, John Maxwell says in his books that the, the, basically the secret to your future success is hidden in your daily routine. And a lot of times if you don't, aren't doing something daily about something, it's just not going to happen. So again, making sure your priorities are focused on what you're doing. I think the key thing to make sure you're on track with doing activities that matter as opposed to just accomplishing things or doing things is that you have to have priorities and at least three priorities per day at the very most six. You don't want to have too many because then you get diffused and you're not focused on that. But every single day when I get up, I have three priorities. Just I have to get these three things done before the end of the day today. And so as a result, I'm able to move forward on multiple projects I'm working on. But I have a master list I kind of go back to. It says, okay, here's the things I need to get done for my last idea day that I'm working on. And then I just implement those different things that way. And how do you fight the distractions? Email, telephone, somebody knocking yeah. on the door. How do you fight that? Uh, <laughs> well, I go I someplace. Find the emails particularly to get in the way. Yeah, I, I, what I do is I close my email browser if I'm working in my office, but a lot of times what I do when I do an idea day in particular, I'll go someplace where no one knows where I'm going to be at. So I go to a public library where I go someplace, I leave my phone in my car, and then I go inside and I just work for a specified period of time on what I have. So I have all the materials I'm going to have to study and look at uh, in my idea notebook, and then an article maybe I've wanted to read I haven't gotten to yet. And then I just focus on, for the first little bit, reading and thinking, and then have, I have a series of questions I go through typically, and I ask, okay, What's my more some priority, priority? What am I going to be working on first and next? And kind of put all those details together. And then I kind of, when I have an extra idea a day, I'll think about, okay, is my, is what I'm working on now, is that actually moving me towards the right direction? Or is this an idea, maybe that's a great idea, but it's just not ready for me to implement now. And I'm going to focus on something that's better for me to do now. I think that's a key component as well. Yeah. How about, uh, do you visualize? Uh, some people, you know, they, they learn by seeing. They, they can't learn. Yeah without seeing. Others can't learn without hearing. Uh, others of us are kinesthetic. We've got to touch and feel and get yep. involved. So what about visualization? You rely on that a great deal? I do. I, I believe in that. And I, a lot of times I finish my idea day, what I'll do is I'll map out things that visually I want to have. So I'll get like those, uh, bo uh, you know, the poster board paper you can get your kids do for projects and stuff like that. And I'll write my idea or the, my most important priorities on that for the next quarter in particular. I'll say, here's what I'm going to be working on this quarter. And I break it down to quadrants. So how am I going to spend my time? And then I block it off into 90-minute segments of time I'm be working on. But every day I can visualize and see, here's what I'm working on, here's what I'm doing. And it keeps me reminded about my most important priority right now, not be distracted by emails or someone else's request or whatever it is. I'm focusing on what it is I'm going to get done. And that's a key component for that. So a lot of times in the morning early, I think about my goals, what I want to accomplish at night before I go to bed. I do that as well. The subconscious mind is constantly working, so when I go to sleep, it could be working on coming up with a solution to a challenge or a problem I'm facing in my business right now as well. Yeah. You talk about also in Franchise Growth Strategies about responding to shifts in the economy. Different sectors yeah. of franchising are affected in different ways by these kinds of shifts. What do you recommend uh, to help franchisors make these uh, shifts, franchisees as well, uh, when, when there's a an opportunity presented by the economy. This may come up as part of an idea day, but it may not be an idea day. It might just be, here's our current situation. How are we going to take care of this? Yeah, great question. Well, I think it's you have to think about what's 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 producing the most profit in my business right now, and uh, do I can I continue to sell to those individuals, or can I find those people in a different way that's more cost effective? So, for example, I talked with a franchisee recently in Denver, Colorado. She does a business and she was spending money on marketing, but she found it wasn't working as well as she was hoping it would. So she was looking at how can I be more effective in finding people that actually know my customer. So she made a list of 30 different ancillary businesses that kind of intersect with hers. And she spends an hour every single day going out and building relationships with those people on that list. And so as a result, she has found more connections with people. She gets more referrals. She does really well in her business because of that. So sometimes it's a geographic segment where, and I talk about this in the book, that you can kind of look at, your, you have a territory typically for your franchise, so you can work within that territory segment. But sometimes it's a demographic. You look at maybe going up, going down, or going sideways in your business or who you're working for. And I, I think it's really incentive. Like, we don't know what's going to happen with the economy going forward right now. There's always ups and downs. But if you look at the last big recession we had in 2008, 2009, it's good to study what other people were doing then. You know, a lot of them were going up, they were going down. So looking for more profit by going for more affluent customers, or they're going down to be more accessible for other people by different offerings they would have. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I talk about this in the book about uh, Harley Davidson in the last recession. They went out and started doing what are called garage parties for women. And they'd invite women to come and try out their motorcycles to education. And they sold a lot of motorcycles that way to a completely different demographic they never thought about before. So sometimes it's that demographic. 
sometimes it's uh, who you're selling to and if you're going up or down. If you look at like QVC, a lot of times they're going down or they're offering a, a product to a, a different niche. If you're going up, you're working with more affluent customers. And so how can you think about that or think about sideways, like where, where Harley Davidson's mostly been known for selling motorcycles to men. Now they have another part of their business where they're selling to women. So that's a, an interesting thing to think about with how you grow the business and doing that. Yeah. So Interesting. So through the years, I've worked with um, dozens and dozens of franchisors at all levels. Some were at startups, some had a thousand or more franchisees, some worldwide, some just in a state or two. And I, I've often thought through and thought back about why does some make it bigger than others make it? It's not only the product, it's not retail versus service, uh, not necessarily that. Right. It comes down to the person. The, these franchisors, particularly the founders, my club of uh, founders, some of whom now, like uh, Fred DeLuca, co-founder of Subway, is not with us anymore. Don Dwyer, one of the terrific marketers, salespeople, and franchising, great motivator, but he's not with us anymore. When I think about how they succeeded and things that I know they did because I traveled with them, worked with them, had times to write books with them and talk to them. Right. What do you think are the differentiators that help franchisors get to 100 outlets as a first goal or very early goal and then go on to get multiple hundreds, get into other countries? Why do some franchisors succeed? Some, no matter what they do, how nice they are, they're not going to. Well, I think a lot of it's who you select for your very first group of franchisees, because if you bring in people that just aren't the right um, fit, they're going to repel people. And you want to have people that are helpful, they understand what they're getting into, and they're going to be working with you to build that brand out. I think it's also the people you surround yourself with, too, the members of your team that are helping you grow the business, that understand franchising, that know more about the business than you do. A lot of times, just who you associate with is going to make a big impact on that. But I think as far as selling franchises, a lot of times franchisors will hire like an FSO. They don't have their business completely, all the support personnel in place. And so they start selling a lot of franchises and they just aren't helping people succeed at it because they just don't understand that mechanical part of the support and how to do that. So the biggest thing I would say is don't sell to people that aren't qualified. I think when people first start selling franchises, they want to sell it any way they can because if they have a pulse and they have a check, yeah. let them in, you know, and that's you not, right. yeah, because you need the money to be able to grow your operation and that's not going to be a long-term good success for you. So the franchisees you have initially are going to help you build that out because you have to be able to validate well. And a lot of times you have franchisors, if they don't do a good job serving their franchisees and help them be successful, they're not going to validate well. And that's going to really slow down your growth of your operations later on. Does it surprise you or shock you in any way that most franchisors never think about qualifying a candidate by their personality, not only for franchising. Do you yeah. have the personality to be a franchisee? Do you have the personality to be my franchisee? Because every franchise system is different. Uh, mm -hmm. The other day I had a young man asking me about a particular uh, franchise that I like very much but it requires him to be an aggressive salesperson. Yeah. And he's my student, and uh, my, I'm, he's not an aggressive salesperson based on the disc profile. And yet, and this franchisor, I like very much, uh, good franchise concept. I don't think this person who I know, this candidate, I don't sell franchises, I'm not a broker, I don't think this candidate is for that franchise. This student yeah. definitely is for franchising. He's looking for an opportunity to, to become a franchisee, but he's missing an important point. You've got to have the personality to work that franchisor system successfully, and not everybody's going to have that personality. I was the CEO of We Buy Ugly Houses. We had uh, 265 franchisees. Why were 50 of them at the top always buying 80 to 100 or more houses a year, and the 20 at the bottom maybe could buy two or three or four houses a year. And it wasn't their fault. It wasn't the franchisee's fault. It was our fault, the franchisor. Because we knew when we, could, when we saw personality, they're probably not going to be able to go out and buy houses. They don't have the personality to do it. But you could hire somebody.
to do that. And that's what we coach right. a lot of people to do. So it, does it shock you? Franchisors don't, what, what, what I just said, franchisors don't speak that way, most of them. Yeah, I think it's really key that you have to do that. I know franchisors who do really well with that. They have them take a Zorical profile. They have them take like a predictive index profile. They'll have them take the disc profile, like you said. And if they don't have the right criteria, they just don't offer a franchise to them. They'll stop the discovery process early. So this isn't the right fit for you. Yeah. But again, most franchisors, they struggle with that because they just want to make sales. And I think exactly in your example there, sales is a very important component of any business. And you have to at least understand how to do it and hire people to do it for you if you can't have that skill set yourself. Yeah. Well, there are some to, businesses, yeah. some businesses where the sales come to you. A lot of retail, yeah. for example, not 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 totally. Uh, situations where people need your service, they're going to come to you. You don't have to call them. You don't have to send them a mailer necessarily. Right. They are going to contact you because they need what you do. But there are probably most of the businesses need some, not necessarily an aggressive salesperson, but somebody who likes sales. And a lot of people don't like sales. And early on, when uh, mailboxes, et cetera, was established, now the UPS store, they were a client of mine. And one of the things their franchisees said to me as I was helping them figure out why they weren't making enough money, um, they were 60 years old. They uh, had already had a career. They retired from that. And they would say, not these exact words each time, but they would say something like, I wanted to buy a place where I could come in every morning, sit behind the counter, collect the money. And this seems to be that kind of a place. People come in to collect their mail. They come in for various services. Yeah, that, that, that could make you some money, maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year, probably not that much. But the guys who were making six figures as franchisees were out knocking on doors to yep. get major businesses, medium-sized businesses in the area to know that their mailboxes, et cetera, existed and that they could be accommodating to what that business needed. A lot of people don't have that. They don't have that desire to get, you know, to go outside. And consequently, the, for a while, mailboxes looked like this was, this was not a business to buy. Yeah, yeah, great point. Well, Gina Whitman wrote a great book called The Entrepreneurial Leap, and it's all about are you the right kind of a person to buy a business or to start a franchise or to start a business, period. And I think that's not a question that's not asked enough, too. I think sometimes people are approaching people, especially in the broker world, who are saying, hey, if you lost your job, maybe we should think about starting a business. They don't really have the mindset to be an entrepreneur or thinking about that with sales skills or whatever it is. And they're just convinced I should buy a business and it can be a passive investment. There's very few, if not any, that businesses you can actually do without working in the business itself, especially initially. And I think to to say otherwise is, a, is not really, is disingenuous, I think, to the person who's investigating the franchise to say, you can start this without having to do anything. It's going to come and put your feet up and you're going to have money rolling in. That's not going to happen. You have to not put effort happen. into it yeah. during a business. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I want to move on to Franchise Sales Secrets, another book. But uh, before I do that, I want to uh, go in a different direction and ask you about this. We hear a lot today about absentee ownership of franchises. Are you for it? Against it? In the middle? Don't have an opinion yet? Well, I think it depends on the franchise itself. I think what the, the idea behind that is that people can put capital in there and then hire a, uh, some, a manager to run the business and stuff like that. I think a lot of times that's undersold what that actually cost and how much time it actually takes to find the right person to run the business. So it's, I think it's much better for someone to come in the business and actually do it, understand all the skill sets, and then they can train people to come in there and do it. To come in there and just expect, I'm going to put money into this and it's going to work, is, I, don't, I think that's a fallacy. It's just not going to happen. You have to put effort into the business for sure. What kinds but, of franchises come to mind, if any, that you would say, all right, I'll put my money into that. I'm not going to work it. I'm going to hire a general manager. I know that won't be complicated to do. I'll have to check everyone with him a couple of hours a week, but um, I'll be absentee and I'll continue doing what I love to do, writing books. What kind of franchises come to mind, if any? that lend themselves to that kind of ownership? Yeah, I think it kind of depends on the skill set of the franchisee, but I think it's, uh, or the franchise candidate who's investigating the business, but you know, there are ones out there like that that are could be a good fit, but it, it really takes the right person to do that. I don't know if I could identify, I think food franchises have been, 
have been one that people have done well with that model, where they, the owner is typically the one who puts the money up to buy the McDonald's franchise, for example. They're not, or the Chick Fil A or whatever. They're not typically in the operation every single day. They might go in a little bit. And they're I would bet Chick Fil A they're in the operation yeah, every day. Well, Chick Fil A they are, but not like McDonald's franchises. You don't see the owners in the new business every single day. I think there's other ones like in the service industry where you don't have to be the one actually going out into the homes to do the the installations or things like that for people. Uh, there's a lot of franchise concepts like that that I think can do really well without without that. They oversee. They can oversee the operation. So I think in the personal, like uh, and like around home services brands, yep. those are a good category. I think where someone can go in there and actually operate it, but they have to find a good manager to run that. And I think they have to kind of be more involved initially when they first start out. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of difficulties with the absentee yeah. model. Um, I think there are a lot of franchisors rolling in their grave whenever we talk when we promote absentee ownership. Not that it doesn't exist, not that it's not possible, not that there aren't people owning uh, different kinds of, uh, many different kinds of franchises on an absentee basis. And when you become a multi-unit or multi-concept operator, you've got five different brands that you're not in each of those every day. You are absentee yeah. in the sense that you're, you're not there, but you've got to be a very different kind of person, a very, you have a very different kind of skill set to be uh, a successful absentee owner than the average person looking to buy a franchise today. My opinion. Right. Yeah. That's a, a good point. I have. A, I just had a conversation with a franchisee down in Georgia a few weeks ago, and he's got six different brands that he runs now, but he's probably more involved in all those different operations than anybody else. I mean, behind the scenes, what he's doing to orchestrate what's happening, he's trained people as he's built the business up. He started with one brand, now he's added more brands on. Uh, so I just think it's a, a little bit of a fallacy that you can kind of come in, put money into something and to find the right person. It's just, it's, yeah. it, you have to put the effort into growing the business. You have to have the right person. And, and you can say that you can find hire somebody to do that, but finding the right person is actually going to be loyal to you, loyal to the business and actually grow it the way you want it to be built yeah. is really the key component here. They're never going to look after your money and your interests right. as well as you are. And this exactly. is something that you have to understand. But too many franchisors are trying to sell this idea of absentee ownership. It's a bad idea. I don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to come back to bite us in the long run. Hope I'm wrong, but we'll see how that uh, how that develops. Yeah. All right. So, James, you have a book, Franchise Sales Secrets, which I enjoyed uh, very much as well. And this is a, a quote from the book. The most important part of branding is to stand for something. You can only stand for something when you specialize. Many franchisors today try to be all things to all people. As a result, the products and services they offer become commoditized because there isn't anything unique about them. Everyone selling the same thing. All right. Yeah. How can a what what can we do to defend? What what should a franchisor be doing to stand for something? Well, I think you have to be clear about what, who you are, your own values, what you stand for, your culture, what it's all about. I think that's going to be attract some people to your franchise. It's going to repel some people to your, from your franchise. But you have to stand out and be different. And I think you have to specialize, as I mentioned. I think too many people are trying to do too many general, broad things, and it's not as effective as it would be if they would just fo focus on one area of their business or one thing they would do. Uh, I interview a lot of franchisees on my Best of the Best in Franchising podcast, which I have you as a guest on. And you know, you. a lot of times people just... Um, they, 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 the ones that are doing the very best, the ones that are really making good money, they're specializing in something. They found a niche market that they do really well at that's really unique. But the people attract them because of who they are and what they represent and how they show up. I'll give you an example. I had a conversation with a 360-degree franchising, which is with premium service brands the other day. And they have, you know, and painting is a very competitive industry anyway. There's a lot of people, painters in the industry. But the way they show up to their customers the way they do their bids, it's so different than anybody else out there that people will choose to go with them even if it's more expensive. And that's a that's a good position to be in as a brand, where you stand for something, your bid is something that's easy to understand, it's not very complicated and convoluted, or it's not like we're gonna do a painting and it's this much money. It actually kind of breaks it down by rooms, you have pictures, and so that is a, an important differentiating point to see that. But I think the biggest thing is you have to, to, to stand for something, is you have to understand how to build value. And I talk about that a lot in my book, uh, Franchise Growth Strategies, in Chapter 7, about how to build value. And most people don't understand that concept very well. So as a result, they really struggle with that. They don't understand, how do I stand out? Why am I different? You know, you know what am I going to do to be unique in, in that way? Um, and then another thing, just, to, just an example from history, is if I were to ask you, who is Bert Hinkler? 
Most people don't know who Bert Hinkler was. No. Uh, he was the second guy who flew across the Atlantic Ocean on an airplane solo. The first guy we all remember, yeah. Charles Lindbergh, right? <laughs> so if you're going to be successful in business, you need to create a new category. Like Amelia Earhart was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo. So you can do things like that. And I talk about that in the book, Financial Sales Secrets in Chapter 4, about how to identify different ways you can kind of stand out and be different, unique in the business. And so I think that's a, comp- a really valuable thing to go through and do that. Um, I actually, I have a podcast called Franchise Sales Secrets, and I've actually just recorded and finished it where all the chapters for that book are all on that podcast. You can listen to it for free if you want to, uh, just listening to the, the, all the different content in the book. But I give a lot of ideas in there yeah. about how to stand for something, how to build a brand. One last thing I'll just say about that topic, you, you addressed this issue in your book that you wrote with Fred DeLuca, the, the, the Start Small, Finish Big. Yeah. In chapter 17, you kind of use the example for branding about talking about Kinko's, which became FedEx Kinko's and became FedEx Office. But you get some great examples in there about how to build a brand and how that was done for Kinko's in particular in chapter yeah. 17 of the book. Yeah, thank you. What about some points that people should discover about themselves? Before I become a franchisee, what should I know about myself? What should I discover about myself? And you, you touch on, you, you provide lots of questions for people to ask, but what would be important for a prospective franchisee to discover about herself, himself, before putting up $300,000 to buy a business? Well, I think, first off, do you really have what it takes to be a business owner? The mindset you have for a business owner is very different than the mindset of an employee. And our education system, for the most part, teaches people to be employees. It teaches people how to think uh, that way and to be an entrepreneur and to think about business ownership and to be an investor that's a completely different set of skills it takes to be able to do that so learning can i learn those skills all learn all business skills are learnable so you can definitely learn them all but it's just are you committed to doing that are you committed to working yourself to figure those things out and execute on those and um, a lot of people the a lot of times people think business ownership is going to be a i'm going to get into my own business everything's going to be great for me if i do that that's not true you have a whole different set of challenges sometimes that come up with being a business owner so identifying, I think, do you have what it takes to be a business owner? And that, that, I think there's a great questionnaire that's in Gina Wickman's book, The Entrepreneurial Leap, that kind of goes through that, where he kind of breaks down what does it take to be a business owner and that mindset required behind that. I have a lot of, chapter, a lot of questions in that in my book, too. But I think it's, uh, from a franchisee's perspective, I think that's a great book to, re- to research or read. It's not a very hard read. It's just a, a hundred and some pages long. But you can go through it fairly quickly, and it can give you a good insight. Do I have what it takes to be a business owner? Or am I willing to learn what it takes to be a business owner? Is that what most people miss? Because, you know, not all franchises succeed. There are a lot of people out there who want to tell you old data from the Department of Commerce that 97% of franchises succeed. That was never true, never proven by anyone ever in history. Uh, There are some franchisors who have great track records, have had very few failures, uh, but that's not the case for for most franchises are are risky, not as risky as the startup, if you buy a good system and if you get in with a good franchisor. Well, some people do fail. Why do they fail? What, are they, what have they not discovered before writing the check? That Well, I think it goes back to Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth. Um, he talks in there about there's three different personality types. There's the visionary, the manager, and the technician. Most people who start a business are technicians. So they don't know how to do the work of the business, but they don't know how to actually have the vision or to manage people within the business. That's different skill sets. Yeah. So what happens is they try to do it all on their own, and then when they start to scale and they get bigger, they have more people coming in, they're trying to manage all of that. They hire people, they hire the wrong person. They don't, they're don't. they not really uh, proactive about how they hire people. So just hire people because they have to, and it's not the right person, and then they kind of, I gotta do everything myself anyway, they're spinning all these plates in the air, and it all crashes down. And then they either choose to go back to be smaller again, or they just quit. And the key thing is you have to develop new skills as you progress in any business. You have to develop a whole new set of skills to become better at that business. But I think that's the key component of why people struggle and fail in business is because of that issue around the e myth that they're technicians. They say, I, I'm doing the one doing the work on the business. I could go out there and do this myself, make a lot more money. But they don't have the visionary skill set. They don't have the managerial skill set necessary to be successful at doing that. Yeah, they get that's trapped into the, the technician's yeah. role. So these, uh, the, these business skills that have to be learned by a franchisee. Franchisor's yep. job to teach those skills? Yes, uh, but also I think it's their job to pick the right people to be in the franchise that actually can do the business. I think if you're a technology business, for example, and someone comes in, they have no idea how to use technology, that's going to be a, a struggle. They're going to really struggle. They can't figure out how to get onto Zoom meetings to do, for example, 
or uh, just to, to meet with a franchise or to learn things, that's going to be a challenge. They or they don't know how to use an app on their phone or whatever it is. I'm kind of giving a, a very general. That's not true for most people, but there are some people that just are not technologically savvy. They should not be in tech type of businesses, for example, or manage people that know how to do or that. Or sales. You know, you, 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 sales, you yeah. can't sell. Probably a more common example of that. They don't you, know you, how to sell. You can go to Sandler. Sandler Training can, yeah. can help you become a better salesperson, but people don't want to take that initiative. And yet, yeah. if, if you don't have these skills that we're talking about, you probably will not succeed as a franchisee. Yeah, I agree with that. So also you talk about a franchisors focusing on what they can control to produce results. And wow, that's, that is a huge topic, a, a book all of its own. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the, the franchisor is supposed to control everything. Franchisors are in charge. It's their way or the highway. So why, why is this an issue that they have to focus on that? You have to focus on the right priorities and the right things you're going to be doing. And too many people focus on things that they have no control over. You can control your productivity. You can control your customer service. You can control um, who you're marketing to. Uh, but again, if you're focusing on things that are not going to give you the success you want, that's going to be that productivity and focus is a key thing. Everybody has productivity kryptonite. And I think it's important to identify, just like Superman, you want to stay away from things that are going to weaken you or not help you be successful. And uh, there's so many distractions in particular today that you have to put time and focus into the right things. So, yeah, I, I, and I talk about that in the, in the book in the Franchise Sales Secrets about the, the five areas I think that are most important for doing that. Productivity is one of them. Uh, customer service is one of them. Or customer satisfaction. Uh, profitability. I talk about quality of experience people have. And uh, are they having a wow experience when they haven't come into your business? And then innovation. Are you, are you innovating in a way that makes you unique and stand out from other people? And if businesses need to have at least three ways you're innovative or unique, or you don't have any, you're really not that unique after all. And so you want to be looking at how am I different in at least three ways? And if I, if you can't answer that question, you're really going to struggle becoming commoditized because you're not standing out from other people. That's something to control by what you choose to go into, what you choose to specialize in, and putting that together as well. All right, James, I like this, uh, this quote from your book. If you do not have a system for selling and you're talking to franchisors, you are at the mercy of the franchise candidate system for not buying. Talk yeah. about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think the, the key thing is, is that people have a system for not buying, just like they do for, and if you've ever been in sales of any kind, you know that if they're sitting out in their car before they come in and talk with you, or they know they have to go on a Zoom meeting, I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to buy, or I have to talk to my wife, or they have some excuse they come up with. And they're thinking through those things, and you have to kind of anticipate that, know how to overcome objections, know what to say, what to do in each of those different situations. So I created a sales training program I offer to franchisors to help them get better at that and have a system for selling where they can actually learn step by step what to do in that process. But the key thing is, going back to that, is that most people don't have a system for, uh, systems are the key part of a franchise, right? Everybody knows they should have systems. And um, I wrote a book called The System is a Secret that really kind of gets into that idea that you, I, wrote, I read the e-month when I first started my own business and it says you need to have systems in that book, but it didn't tell you how to do it. So I wrote that book to help me understand how to do that for myself or what I've learned about creating systems in my own business. And it's been very, very helpful to people to identify that. But most franchisors, they might have good systems in their, like their, their model, their business, but they don't have good systems for how to run their business themselves. They don't have good systems for, uh, for selling, for example. And that's key. You have, to know, you have to know what people are going to say or anticipate it before they bring it up. And even how you present your franchise, you need to handle all these objections. Here's all the concerns or fears that people are having right now. And you have to work through those one by one by one. So they get to the point they're saying, okay, I'm ready to buy. Uh, I, for example, I had a franchise candidate yesterday I was working with that, uh, that gone through the whole process. And fear just comes up. Like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I have the money. I'm ready to do this. But, man, I'm sure scared. This is nervous. I'm not sure if I want to do this. That's a big thing. You have to have a system for how you're going to cover fear. Know what all those fears are, what their fears are, and then systematically go through one by one and have them talk with franchisees in the validation process which is a system where you have them listen to interviews you've done with franchisees in a podcast interview that says, here's how I overcame this fear. And they say, okay, I could do that. And so they start visualizing themselves actually doing the business. But that's key. You have to have your own system for selling, and it has to be better than the, the customer or the customer, basically the franchise candidate system for not wanting to buy mm -hmm. and overcoming those fears. So when we go through all of these uh, systems that we've been talking about that are necessary for a franchise yeah. or to be successful, it seems to me that it takes a lifetime to create systems. When would you ever get to that point from A to Z 
Or you can say, at Z, I can now sell my franchises. I'm ready to be a franchisor. How long does this take to create all these well, systems? Yeah, that's a, a tough question because you have to constantly be working on it. The key thing is you have to schedule time to work on your systems because most people don't develop systems until they lose money or until they make a mistake that costs them a lot of money. Then all of a sudden they say, okay, we got to figure this out. This is really important to figure this out. But at that point, you've already lost the money. It's much better to be proactive and say, okay, I'm going to work on these systems a little bit all the time. But the answer to the question is they're never completely done. There's always going to be evolution to that. You have to kind of adapt those and change those in different situations. As you grow bigger, you're going to have to adapt and change your systems to have more people. But the key thing about a system is it has to be something that everybody in the organization understands and that they follow. And they have to, it has to be delineated what to do in those situations. So every situation that's possible has been thought through, it's been documented, it's been written down, and you can do that. So you can be adding that, well, this, this situation never happened before, so we should be paying more attention to this, and we need to have a documented process for that. So it's, it's, but the key thing is everybody in your organization has to understand the system and follow it. If you don't do that, then you're not, you don't have, really have a good system. Yeah. So James, how do people contact you? Uh, well, I have a website called FranchiseSalesAssociation.com. They can go to there. If they go on there, they can actually click on a picture of my book and download a free copy of it if they want to get it digitally, right. just by giving me the email address. They can go listen to my Franchise Sales Secrets podcast if you want to. Uh, you can also email me at james at FranchiseSalesAssociation.com if you want yeah. to as well. Very good. Well, very insightful conversation. I enjoyed the time we spent together, and I wish you well. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Franchise Hot Sea Podcast with Dr. John P. Hayes. Tune in next time for more conversation around all things franchising.